Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I was supposed to be sharing a different video with you, but the technological gods are working against us. Luckily, I received some exciting mail this week, so I've tried to put together another video that you will enjoy in the meantime. It has been over two and a half years since our last proper Swatch With Me video, so I think it's time to revivify the series with A Gallo. A Gallo is a handmade watercolor company based in Assisi, Italy, founded by artist Alina Gallo and specializing in honey-based watercolor. This small business is woman-owned, dedicated to creating paints free of mercury, lead, cadmium, and cobalts, and partners with One Tree Planted, meaning one tree is planted for every order placed on their website. Their values seem to align wonderfully with everything we love here on this channel, and I'm only bummed that I couldn't figure out a way to show them off to you sooner. I did reach out to A Gallo to ask for a dot card specifically for the swatching series, which they have provided, but otherwise this video is not sponsored and they have not asked me to say anything about their company or paints. The dot cards arrived in sturdy packaging and have generous samples of paint along with the complete pigment information printed under each on watercolor paper. I will be swatching these out on another sheet of watercolor paper to provide you with larger swatches, but you could also sample them directly on these cards if you were to order one yourself. This is a first impression swatching video of their entire line as of August 2022. It is meant to help buyers make informed purchases when deciding between multiple colors and high resolution scans are available on my Patreon. Please note what you're seeing in this video is the extent that I have worked with these paints so far. If you'd like to see a full review or additional content featuring these watercolors, please leave a comment below and let me know what you're interested in seeing. A short aside before we jump in, I wanted to share a little life hack that I recently learned from the Tree Marie soap that blew my mind. I don't know why I hadn't thought about doing this before, but I, I don't know. When you are trying to divide something, in this case watercolor paper, into equal sections, but the number of sections is not easily divisible by the width, in this case again paper, angle your ruler until you hit a number that is. In this case, I am trying to divide the paper into six columns, but the paper is 23 centimeters wide. I angled the ruler until I hit 24 centimeters, then I marked every four centimeters. I repeated it on the bottom of the paper and then connected the lines like I would normally. I'm going to pass the reins off to real-time scatterbrained Denise, so please be kind to her. All right, so we're ready to start swatching the A Gallo dot card. I'm going to leave this dot card on top of my swatch card for the first row so that you can see how the paints re wet and how they apply to the paper. And then as we move further down, I'll move this off to the side and just kind of give you my insights as we go along the way. Today, I'm gonna to be swatching on Arches Cold Press Watercolor Paper with a silver black velvet brush. Our first color is Buff Titanium. It lifted up very easily there. It's made from PW6 colon one. Buff Titanium is not a color that I use very often, but I know a lot of people do. I think it's really useful for um, urban sketchers in particular, but also I've heard it's really great for landscapes and it makes really pretty mixes when you mix it with um, brighter colors. So if you mix it with like a uh, quinacridone magenta, for instance, it makes a really soft powdery pink color and uh, you can do the same with greens to make teals and, and all kinds of fun stuff. Next up we have Lemon Yellow, and it looks like there is a little dot of something on there, so I'm just going to clean that off so we can get a nice fresh swatch. This is our standard PY3. You might have heard this color referred to in other brands as Hansa Yellow Light. It is a bright, cool yellow. I wanted to try and make these swatches more versatile than I have in the past. It has been like two and a half years since I've done a swatch with me video, so I'm really excited to be doing this today. 
Um, but over the years, my preferences for the way I learn my paints have changed. And instead of doing just a solid gradient from top to bottom, I'm going to be doing like this variegated wash, diluting it with some water and trying to cause a little bit of blooming here and there so that we can see how the paints react to that. All that water colory goodness. And, um, yeah, there are so many videos here on YouTube for Agallo that do have the more standard swatching if you are interested in that. So I encourage you to go to the search bar after this video and, and take a look for other YouTubers if you haven't already come across them. The first artist that I heard talk about Agallo watercolors years ago was Sade from Sadie Saves the Day, and I know that she has been a really big fan of these watercolors for, for quite some time, and honestly, I think it was just life circumstances that I didn't explore these sooner. Um, this color that we just swatched here, my apologies, I'm rambling, bad at multitasking. Uh, Lemon Yellow Permanent, it's PY184. Next up we have Azo Gold, made from PY151 and PY43. So what was I talking about? Um, oh, I was saying how uh, I didn't come across these earlier in terms of having them in my own studio for a couple of reasons, I think. They were just starting to get traction. Um, well, I know they've been around for, for a while, uh, but I, I remember starting to see more of them in maybe like 2019, 2020, and of course with the pandemic and everything, life just kind of got away from me, and uh, we also uh, know <laughs> that I uh, had to take a, a bit of time off to deal with some personal things over the last couple of years, so I just wasn't producing as much content. I'm really excited to be testing them out now since uh, we seem to share a lot of values. Next up is Royal Yellow PY154. PY154 is a color that I use a lot of. Uh, this is a color that uh, and a lot of different brands have, it doesn't normally go by its uh, chemical name is what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's either called Permanent Yellow or like in Da Vinci's line, it's Da Vinci's line and Windsor and Newton, it's Windsor Yellow, I believe, I think. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think that's true. Um, I, I know that a lot of brands carry it. It's a beautiful mid-tone yellow that is really vibrant and doesn't really lean too warm or cool. The Azo Yellow Gold is a really nice semi-transparent color. It has kind of, um, you can definitely tell that there's that PY43, which is uh, typically like a yellow ochre or a raw sienna-like color, uh, which we will get to later on in the video. There are a lot of them. We've got to get going quicker if we want to do this video in any uh, reasonable amount of time. So here on the end of this first row is Indian Yellow. This is kind of like a new gamboge type color um, with PY110 and PY154. I made an error when I was, you know, just just a just a little inconvenience when I was taping out this swatch card is that I should have definitely left a border because it would have A, been easier to go up all the way to the edge <laughs> of a taped border instead of to the edge of the paper. And uh, this way I'm gonna end up painting my table a whole bunch, which hopefully <laughs> we don't get our, our new background too messy. That is a typical version of this color that I would expect to see. It's uh, mostly transparent, which is really nice to see, and uh, just a really beautiful golden color. So I am gonna move this off to the side so that we have a little bit more room and flexibility and I'm not dragging my hand across it, and I am gonna zoom you in a little further. Next up, we have a word I'm probably not gonna say correctly. Aroncioni? Arancioni. It means orange in Italian, and it is orange. <laughs> it's made from PY83, PV19, and PR101. Uh, something that you will see throughout this video and throughout this brand is that there are a lot of mixed colors. Um, we've talked about this on and off uh, on the channel before, and I think 
You know, we all typically come from a place early on in our journeys. Well, I shouldn't say all. I guess it's one of two camps. We either use a lot of craft paint that is full of mixes, or once we learn a little bit more about pigments, we're told by a lot of people that single pigments are the only way to go, and that you should use single pigments for the best, brightest mixtures, and that's not always true. Um, they can give you a lot more freedom and flexibility, and certainly if you are on a limited budget, I would recommend uh, fewer single pigments, and that way you can mix all the other colors you need instead of getting a bunch of specialty colors, which have more limited uses. Um, but when you're looking at a color like this, where it's going to be an orange color, it's got a yellow pigment, it's got a red pigment, uh, it's got a violet pigment, it's going to behave in a way that you expect it to. Um, it's not like you're combining crazy colors that don't belong next to each other. So it would just depend between these two, for instance, like which, oh, you can't see me pointing because I zoomed in. <laughs> so there's the um, Arancioni and there's the Indian yellow, right? And they're very similar in hue. This one is a little deeper, a little bit more orange. Um, and just depending on which one you want in your palette would be the one you would go with. Next, we have Hokkaido Orange. Hokkaido is an island in Japan. So I am assuming this is in reference to colors that you might find there or traditional colors. I don't know as much about that area of the world. Um, it is made with PY216. This is rated as a semi-opaque color and is listed, I believe that is a non-granulating. Is that what that's indicating? Let me look through my sheet. Yep, I think it's saying non-granulating, but I see some texture in there. I wonder if it'll dry more smoothly. Try and put some blooms in here. I wanna see what these colors do. All right, next up we have Vermilion Red. This is PR255, so this would typically be referred to as a pyrrole scarlet. It is closely uh, related to PR254, which is pyrrole red. It maybe isn't quite as orange as some people would be used to seeing a vermilion, but it is a beautiful color. And then we have uh, Medici, 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 probably, Medici, <laughs> red. Um, that is the name of a wealthy Italian family. I tried to look up as much as I could in terms of the names that I didn't recognize so that I would be a little bit more informed in telling you about them. Um, this is made with PR168. And this is a really lovely bright red. This also isn't rated as granulating, but it's got some beautiful texture to it. All right, I am going to remember to slide over. Look at that. I did it. <laughs> I forget to do that constantly. Uh, next, we have Scarlet Red. This is our PR254, so this is going to be kind of paired with our Vermilion over here. And I actually see I missed a spot on that Vermilion, so we'll go back to it and make sure that um, we get that whole swatch going nicely. Uh, this is a beautiful version of PR254. It's going on so much smoother than I'm used to seeing red pigments from a lot of handmade companies. We're gonna get rid of that white there, maybe create a bloom. <laughs> and in this case, that's fine. We wanna see what the colors do. This scarlet red, oh my goodness. Gonna add some water that should push back pretty heavily. Pyrrole red is a color that blooms pretty readily in water. I like to use this color a lot when I'm painting chickens for their combs. 
And last on this row, we have Ruby Red made from PR264. This one is taking just a little bit more effort to re-wet. This is a really deep red color. And I'm gonna have to move my water cups to the side as we move on up. All right, here we have Alizarin Crimson Hue, which is what it's labeled on my swatch card, but the website called it Alizarin Crimson Permanent, if you're looking at it there. I did forget to mention at the top of this that um, a Gallo is because they're a small company, they have launches about once a month where they restock their shops. So they're not going to be available kind of around the clock. Probably not when you're watching this. If you're watching it the day it comes out, I believe that their next restock is August 28th. And you can check their restocks on their website and on their Instagram account. So if you are interested, in picking up some of these colors make sure to check out their website one thing i do love about their website is that they have um all of their stock is still showing so you can look at everything on the website a lot of companies that do monthly releases will have their products offline so you can't see them until they go live which makes it a lot harder to plan out what you want to purchase but their website has all their stock there so you can look around, see what's available, and kind of plan your purchase before the rush of, of getting your order in. That Alizarin Crimson Hue uh, was made with PR-177, PR-144, and PV-19. One thing to note is I believe that PR-177 has recently come out as a fugitive color. Kimberly Crick, if you don't already know her work, does a lot of light fastness testing and is just, does has a wonderful database. Highly recommend checking out her channel and her website uh, for any light fastness needs. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think PR177 is one of those colors. Then we also have Permanent Carmine, which is made from PV19, which is a light fast color. And next up, we have Quinacridone Magenta, made from a PR-122. I also want to note, we will get to it a little bit, uh, a couple of specific colors later on that I can point to. I'm not well versed in the entire history of the pigment offerings with this company, but if you haven't already heard, um, there are a couple more pigments that are going out of stock, going are being discontinued. And so a lot of manufacturers are having to reformulate some things. And so uh, if you have seen an older version of one of their swatch cards or one of their palettes and you're seeing different pigment information here, I'm guessing that maybe there were just some changes that were made to formulas. So definitely keep that in mind. I got the most relevant information I could based on the swatch card and double check the ones I wasn't sure about on the website and they are all matching as of August when I'm recording this video. We get a little bit more of that magenta in the corner here. A nice, bright, beautiful color. I love how rich this version is. Then we have Ultramarine Pink. I'm guessing that these next three colors are going to be a little bit hard to re-wet, so I'm going to put a drop of water on each of them. Ultramarine Pink is made with PR259. It's kind of a purplish pink as I splatter paint all over my <laughs> swatch card. Luckily, Mineral Violet is going down here, and uh, that's a very similar color. So... <laughs> Anyway, all right, Ultramarine Pink. Uh, it is PR259, and it's kind of a purpley pink that granulates. 
Again, the card says it doesn't granulate, but I've I've known this as a granulating color and it seems to have that or or I'm just looking at the wrong letters. Let me double check. It's a yes or no. I'm pretty sure that says no, but I could be wrong. Ultramarine pink is a very lightly toned color most of the time, so it's not going to be as deep or as vibrant as like a quinacridone color. Sorry, I'm fidgeting with the swatch a lot. It might be annoying to watch. <laughs> there we go. Next, we have Pietra Rosa, which Pietra means stone. So this is a stone pink type of color. It's made from Potter's Pink, PR233, um, PV19, and PV16. And I love it. I have been going through some kind of weird belated pink phase in my life. Um, I think I just really need those like nurturing, calming pink vibes <laughs> as of late in my life. And I love this color so much. I feel like this color is similar to what a lot of us think of Potter's Pink being in our heads, but it's got that little extra vibrancy that maybe Potter's Pink on its own is lacking a little bit. Unfortunately, I lost you there for a moment, but I only missed two colors with you. So we swatched out the Potter's Pink after the Pietra Rosa, and it's also a completely gorgeous color. As I was saying with this color, it's just a little bit more muted, a little less pink. A little bit more granulation since one of the colors in the uh, Pietra Rosa does not granulate. Um, but yeah, it's a really gorgeous color. And then we skip down to Quinacridone Violet. I was letting these two colors re-wet. And this is PV55, which is a newer color to watercolors. Um, a lot of Quinacridone Violets are also made with a PV19 that leans more towards violet. And this one has been uh, added to more collections over the last couple of years. I am going to drop in a little bit more color here since uh, that swatch got a little bit funky while I was trying to fix the camera and uh, this ultramarine pink as well. We didn't quite get this little lower bit colored so I'm just going to soften off those edges there. All right and now we can zoom back in and head on over to these guys. All right, so we have two naturally based pigments here. That's why you see an N instead of a P at the beginning of its pigment number. This is NR9, which is Genuine Rose Matter. This is a color that hasn't been used for quite a while uh, in terms of most mainstream palettes because it's very fugitive. However, a lot of people still really love working with it and uh, so a few few brands offer some specialty mixes knowing that these aren't very light fast colors. Most of A Gallo's watercolors are rated as 7 or 8 on the blue wool scale. I think that's what they use. Um, and these two colors here are rated as 3s. I think I mentioned possibly, I don't know, I'm filming the intro to this video after the, uh, after our swatching here. So who knows if I mentioned it or not, but, uh, a Gallo is an eco friendly, uh, watercolor company. They don't use any leads or cadmiums or, um, cobalts in their formulations. So there's going to be a lot of hues when we, well, we already kind of got to that area, right? We don't have any of those cadmiums that we would typically see in the red range or even the yellows. Um, but they are not vegan, is what I was going to say. I believe that Rose Matter... Now I'm second-guessing myself. Is Rose Matter made from the insects or is that Carmine? Are they the same thing? I'll have to look that up. I will try and remember to put on the screen if I do, but uh, <laughs> this one I looked up because I haven't seen it before. This is made from a plant called 
Daemonord drops. Daemonord drops Draco. It's a resin from that plant. So it looks very similar to the Rose Matter. It's a little bit more red, a little bit more vibrant, whereas this is a little bit more subdued. I think those are definitely colors that pigment collectors would appreciate, but uh, don't feel the need to go out of your way to purchase them. Oh, I also wanted to mention that most of A. Gallo's watercolors are 8, uh, 9, or 9 and 50 euros, which at the time of recording this video, a euro is about equivalent to a US dollar right now. Um, but there are a couple of colors that fall outside of that range. So Rose Matter is one of them, Lapis Lazuli is one of them, and the Yinmin Blue is also uh, the most expensive paint that they produce. Here we're on to Mineral Violet, which is PV16. We saw that in this mixture up here. It must just be a very small amount that is added to that blend since it's not very prominent. It's another color similar to the ultramarine pink that is not heavily, um, it doesn't have a heavy tinting strength. And it does nicely, softly granulate. All right, guys, sorry there. I was painting out Tyrian purple, but I was off camera, uh, just like off that direction after boasting that I did so well in the previous row. Um, Tyrian purple is uh, named for the uh, Lebanese port of Tyr, and um, it is made with PV15 and PV16, which lands right between the mineral violet and the ultramarine violet, which we're going to paint next. Um, this is another color that it's a little bit more um, more need of some coaxing to re-wet, but this brand actually does a pretty good job. I think out of the professional brands of paint that I've tried, and including this in, in this statement, Daniel Smith is usually the hardest to re-wet uh, for this type of color, the ultramarine violet, the ultra... Uh, or the mineral violet, the lapis lazuli, all of those colors, uh, Potter's Pink, um, Viridian, really hard to, to re-wet in brands like Daniel Smith, but these ones have been having a really easy time in comparison. All right, we're moving the paper. Look at that. Okay, we've got Dioxazine Violet up next, and this is not made with the standard PV23. It is instead made with PV37. There are a couple of brands that use this pigment for Dioxazine Violet. Um, it is still a heavily staining, non-granulating, dark purple. This is really pretty. Um, this is more red-leaning than most dioxazine violets, which I prefer. I don't like cool-leaning purples. <laughs> I like red-leaning purples. So this one uh, checks off that box for me. I don't know about the light fastness. They rate theirs as an 8. Um, I feel like I've heard in the past that this color isn't as light fast as maybe a PV23, but that is just going off of my faulty memory, so please don't quote me on that. Some really beautiful texture in here. Again, it's a non-granulating color, but a lot of these colors have beautiful texture to them. I don't know if that's because they are hand mold, um, but... I'm really loving it. All right, the next one I've heard a lot about, this is called uh, Noturno. Not, Turno. Probably not saying that with the right emphasis, but it means night in Italian. And it's a fan favorite of a lot of people who love this brand. It's made from Ultramarine Blue PV29, sorry, PB29. Um, PR101 and PV19. Um, PR101 can come in a lot of variants, so I don't know exactly which one they used for this. It could be transparent, it could be opaque. Um, my guess is that it's one of the more opaque ones because not only is this 
a deeper color, but there's a lot of granulation. So unless the, when we get down to their ultramarine, we'll see how much that granulates, but depending on, um, I think this would need a little bit more help in the granulation department. So uh, it's super pretty um, and I can't wait to see that dry. I'm gonna make sure to add some extra water to get some blooms in here so we can really see that pigment separate. Next, we have another specialty one. I'm going to let it re-wet for a moment. We'll skip over and go to the cerulean blue hue. Um, we have zirconium blue that we'll come back to, which I'm very glad that they have. Um, cerulean hue is made from PB15-3. That's the standard phthalo blue. And then a PW4 and a little bit of a PB29, which I was really excited to see. A lot of cerulean hues are just white and phthalo blue, and they've added the ultramarine so that it granulates, which, why haven't we been doing that all along? I'm super excited about that. <laughs> I'm really excited to try this out, uh, like in a, a painting. Super exciting. It's also very pigmented because of that phthalo color. Um, it's very close to a cerulean hue. It's a little bit brighter, but that's to be expected. Yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about that right now. You've got the opacity from the white that's in there, which is something that I look for in ceruleans. I want it to hold a little bit of body. You guys, I was almost off screen again. You could see most of it though, right? I'm sorry. I'm really trying. It's been two and a half years since I've recorded one of these videos. I gotta get back in the groove. All right, we're gonna go back to that zirconium blue. This is made with PB71. Um, I've had a chance to try this out. Um, I'm trying to think, I know I've tried autos. I feel like I've maybe tried one or two other brands. It's a really beautiful cerulean light color. It is granulating. It is like a very bright sky blue. And uh, as long as I, you know, I let that water sit on it for a moment, but it's rewetting fine with that. All right. We're moving the page. We've got Transparent Cerulean, which is their Thalo Blue. This is just a PB15 colon 3. Should be pretty standard here. Something that does happen with some handmade Thalo colors is that they can have like an interesting texture to them, but not quite granulation. It's just like a result of not having the paint mold finely enough, and I don't see that with this color at all. Um, it looks very smooth. Gonna get that nice dark tone in the corner so we can see its full vibrancy. Get some extra water to make it bloom. And finishing out this row, we have Azuro, which means light blue in Italian. And this one is made from PB29, that's ultramarine blue, and phthalo blue with that PB15 colon 3. So this should be a nice approximation between a phthalo and an ultramarine. So for instance, if you weren't going to have a split primary palette, if you weren't going to have both ultramarine and a phthalo blue, you could just have this color and have that be kind of a, a middle approximation of both colors. Next up, we have our specialty colors, Yinmin Blue and Lapis Lazuli. I'm gonna put a little dot of um, water on both of those to let them rewet a little bit. And I'm gonna hop on over to Ultramarine Blue Dark. When I was writing out the color sheet, I forgot to put Lapis Lazuli. It's at the end of the row, so we'll come back to that. So I'm gonna put Ultramarine Blue right here.
Wow, that is a really pretty ultramarine. I think subconsciously, one of the reasons, did I finish this thought earlier? I don't even remember if I finished this thought earlier. I was talking about why I haven't tried a gala before because they match so well with my ideals. And I was talking about the pandemic and that, you know, finances were a little bit tight. Um, so they, there are, they are a more expensive brand. And, um, I think that's why I didn't let, let myself look at a lot of content around them because I knew that I would want them if I did. <laughs> and that's true. These are gorgeous. These are so beautiful. I can tell that this is going to uh, granulate a good amount. All right, we'll pop back over to the Yinmin Blue. This is closer to maybe a cobalt blue. Super pigmented. I left that water drop on there for, you know, as long as it took me to get back to it, but that is a very saturated blue, especially I know that some people have talked about having troubles re-wetting re re Kramer's version. Uh, no problems here. Beautiful payout. <clears throat> it's actually, it's very close to the ultramarine. It's, um, it's opaque like a cobalt blue is, but the hue is pretty similar. It's maybe a little bit more muted. Now just a, a little bit more in here. A little bit more water to get some blooms going. And then we'll head on over to Periwinkle. This uh, blend is made with four colors. It is PB15 colon one, which is Thalo Blue Red Shade. Then they've got the Ultramarine Blue, the PB29. We've got the PW6, which is white. And the, uh, sorry, Titanium White. <laughs> and then PR122. So we're leaning towards really warm colors. We've got the warm Thalo Blue. We've got the warmer Ultramarine. We've got a magenta color in here and then softening it off with that white. It's really pretty. I don't normally gravitate towards colors with white in them. Um, I, they tend to be really good for floral painters, but this is a really gorgeous color. I mean, I guess there's been a couple of colors that I glazed over earlier. Um, since we've hit our stride with these uh, granulating colors, I feel like I only have good things to say. <laughs> I'm in a, a granulation phase, what can I say? All right. Midnight Blue is next. I'm really excited for this one. Um, I've seen it in some other videos and it looks really pretty. This is again the PB15 colon 1, which is that uh, red shade of phthalo blue. And there's a bit of black pigment in here. And again, I was mentioning before that these are not vegan paints, even though they're eco-friendly paints. Um, I don't think I mentioned at that time because what is my brain anymore? <laughs> but they are honey-based paints. And this one has PBK9 in it, which is bone black. So just be aware of that if that's something that you want to avoid in your paints. But the hue of this color is beautiful. It's a very deep uh deep phthalo type of color, which makes sense since it's phthalo and black. <laughs> All right, we're gonna drop in some more water and head on over to our Indian throne. I'm interested to see how this dries. Um, when I first put it down on the page, it's not super saturated. Um, and as long as it doesn't lose too much saturation while it dries, I think this would be a really nice color. We've talked about this on the channel before. I really loved um, Anthroquinone Blue from M. Graham because it was more saturated than the only other version I had used at the time, which was Daniel Smith's Indian Throne. And Daniel Smith's Indian Throne is very dull. It's a very gray blue. Um, and so I really gravitated towards the brighter versions of this color, this pigment. 
Uh, did I say PB60? I'm sorry if I did not. Um, and so I am interested to see how this one dries. And now we'll come back to the lapis lazuli that we had sitting with some water on it from earlier. This is a genuine color made from the stone that shares the same name. This was the predecessor to ultramarine. And you can probably tell that by the way it looks. Again, um, I think I've maybe only used this in like Daniel Smith's dot card and then maybe one or two other brands, if that. It's not a color that I'm super familiar with. Um, but this version seems nice. It rewets well. It's still not going to be as saturated as an ultramarine blue is, but just depends what you're looking for. Um, this one is 15 euros per half pan. So that's important to note. And then the Yinmin blue, uh, is a very limited color. Very few people are making it. And that one is a whopping 40 euros for, um, a half pan. That's four zero. Uh, but yeah, those are some, those are some nice colors. Moving on to our next row, we have copper blue, which I've never seen a color called copper blue. I imagine it is kind of like the patina from a copper uh, is what I, I'm guessing. Um, I think that they could make that pigment uh, by oxidizing question mark <laughs> copper and then using that as pigment and it was very toxic so they've made a hue here that is made out of PW4 which is Chinese white not titanium white uh, it's a little bit more transparent uh, PG7 PB15 colon 3 and PY3 so you've got a phthalo blue a phthalo green some bright yellow and then a little bit of white or a lot of white probably <laughs> to mute it on down. Um, it's a really pretty kind of sea foam green type of color. And then next we have teal blue, which is I believe meant to mimic a uh, cobalt teal. This is made with that phthalo blue, uh, PB153, PG7, and then the titanium white, which is more opaque since cobalt teal is a more opaque color. Um, I really like their attention to detail with their hues about the colors that they are adding seem to be very intentional with adding that little bit of ultramarine to the ceruleans that you add some granulation. And then we've got... Um, that white in the teal blue to kind of mimic some of the opacity that you would find in a, a cobalt teal or cobalt turquoise. I'm a fan. This one was interesting and I didn't have a ton of time to research it, but it is made with a different phthalo blue pigment. This is PB15 colon four, and you don't see that very often. Um, it also has PG7, which is phthalo green, and PB29 for that ultramarine. Um, this is gonna be similar to your phthalo turquoise or your ultramarine turquoise colors. It's got all those <laughs> working for it. Beautiful bright teal make some really beautiful kind of deep moody teals if you mix in darker colors to it. I'm trying not to mention the noise in the background because I don't want to call attention to it if you guys can't hear it, but if you can, I apologize. Um, there's all kinds of noises happening around where I'm at. Uh, we've got construction on both sides of my apartment. There's a truck right now that's running outside the window that's pretty loud, and it's also a billion degrees, so the AC in the other room is on and two fans are on trying to blow the AC air in here, so um, I think it's okay for the most part and that you shouldn't have too much interference, but if you can hear that on like your headphones or something, I do apologize. Kind of unavoidable for today.
Then we have Harbor Blue. This is another color I am super excited about, more so than the Midnight Blue. It looks absolutely stunning. It is made with Phthalo Blue and PBR8, which is a manganese brown, which we don't see very often on its own. I think Schminka has some PB8 on its own, but I didn't double check that before the stream. Oh, it's so pretty, and it does look like a harbor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm obsessed. I'm definitely going to need to add this to my wish list. Then we have Dark Forest and Forest Green is going to finish out this row. They are both made with PG7, PBK7, and PY43. So that's going to be your Thalo uh, Green, your Carbon Black, and some version of that Yellow Ochre adjacent color. And I'm imagining just in different concentrations between these two colors next to each other. This would fill the need of like a perylene green on a palette. It's a little bit more green than a perylene green is. A little brighter, a little more saturated. Yeah, I can already tell I'm um, just re-wetting this. This uh, forest green is going to have more phthalo green in it. See those really vivid, bright colors. Come to think of it, I don't know if... I don't think they have a phthalo green on its own. So this would be as close as you're going to get to... Uh, a PB or a PG seven. Put some water uh, by the name here and hopefully cause a back run there so we can see more of the pigment information. All right, the Viridian Hue is another one of these colors that they're really paying attention to detail on, um, along with our other hues. This is a PG7, which is what most Viridian Hues are made out of, um, either by itself or with like a white. Um, but they've also added some ultramarine here to add with some granulation. Um, this isn't as soft as I would expect a Viridian Hue to be. It's a little bit more vibrant, but I am excited about the granulation at least. And, sorry for the cat hair, <laughs> um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing this one dry. It is definitely less intense than a phthalo green would be, so that is good to note. Uh, so actually, I guess I was wrong about the forest green. This is probably the closest to a phthalo green. It's just not going to be anywhere near as saturated, which if you don't like the saturation of a phthalo green and you want it to be a little bit less intense, this would be a good option. Then we have Deep Sea Green. This is made with one of my favorite pigments, uh, PG8. Um, it is worth noting that a lot of manufacturers note PG8 as a fugitive color. Uh, it is the color green in White Knight's line, and it is a beautiful hue. I did my own light fastness tests on White Knight's version of PG8, and I didn't have any fading issues, but um, I've, had, I've heard of other people doing tests on other types of PG8 and having issues. So just be aware of that if you're going to be using it in a sketchbook or away from a uh, UV light. It's okay, but keep that in mind. And then this also has um, that P B29 Ultramarine in it to give it that C vibe. 
Another thing I was really excited to see with this brand is that they have two green earths and the one that is cool green earth, uh, sorry, that is green earth cool, um, looks absolutely stunning in videos. So I'm really excited to try that out. I'm going to let the water sit on it for a moment and we're going to skip over to Malachite Hue. Um, this is made with both phthalo greens, PG7 and PG36, um, along with titanium white and egg shells, which is another obviously uh, not vegan component, but another byproduct at least. And very interesting. I've never seen a paint that had eggshell in it. Uh, Malachite I've seen in a few handmade brands and a few professional brands actually too, but Malachite is actually toxic when you <laughs> add water to it, which for watercolors uh, seems like an oversight. Uh, so I had one, I believe from like Neela Kalori that I got rid of. Um, I think that's the only one that I personally owned, but just keep that in mind. If you have Malachite, please be very careful. It's toxic when mixed with water. All right, we've got this green earth cool and it is just such a pretty hue. It's such a soft, granulating earthy colors. I mean, it's just, it's right there in the name. I've never been a huge fan of the more standard green earth that we're going to see later on, but this one is super beautiful. It's made from PG 23. My apologies to I'm having to paint at very awkward angle at this point, trying to avoid the wet charts and the wet dots. So, <laughs> guys, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I tried. I tried so hard. Uh, I was just saying that um, these two colors are probably going to be two of my lesser favorite colors in the set because I'm not a big fan of bright greens. This one is spring green made with PG7, PY184, and PB29. Um, it's got a little bit of opacity to it from that lemon yellow permanent that we saw earlier. Um, and then we also have this Thalo green light coming up next to it. It's also made with that PY184 and PG36. Um, just your real in your face neon type of green color. Um, I wish I had some more insights for you on it, but I don't because I never use this color. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever voluntarily purchased it unless it was in a set. Rounding down the trio of greens that I'm not gonna be a fan of, we have Fig Green, which is made with PY151 and PG17, which is Chromium Oxide Green, and we'll see that in a couple of colors here, I think. Um, and this is just going to be another, kind of like a chartreuse yellow-green. Try and get that off my backdrop before it stains. There we go. Um, so I know a lot of people are a fan of this. I can name two very good friends of mine who would love this color, uh, but it is just not in my ballpark. Then we have green gold, and they don't have uh, PY129 anywhere in their line from what I could see. This is made from PY150, uh, PY184, and PG36. To it, um, Those were a combination of words that didn't actually make words. <laughs> it is an approximation of PY129, but this seems to be a little bit more intense, a little bit more yellow. Definitely leaning towards the gold more so than the green. And it's not quite as transparent. Be, um, it's not quite quite as transparent as the PY129 because of the PY184. Uh, I have trouble with numbers. Um, I'm not. I, I've never been diagnosed as dyslexic, and I certainly don't have it when it comes to like standard reading. But with numbers and acronyms. 
Um, I mess them up all the time. Uh, I'll be looking at something and I know comprehensively what it says, but I'll repeat it or write it down incorrectly. So <laughs> I have to think a little extra hard sometimes. Then we have their Sap Green, which is made with PY83, PG36, PV19, and PR101. Um, I believe, let me look for it. Yes, so we're gonna get down to quinacridone gold a little bit later. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, PO48 is being discontinued. Um, there are a few manufacturers who still have enough to get through a couple years supply. Um, however, most pigment maker or paint makers are kind of discontinuing the colors that they relied on for those mixtures. So um, I'm guessing, I don't have any confirmation of this, but I'm guessing with those two pigments that it had some version of their quinacridone gold in it before and that had to be replaced with the new mixture that they're using um, to kind of approximate that PO48 that we're losing. This is a very pretty sap green. It is a little bit more opaque. Um, has a little bit more body to it than you might normally see in a sap green, but it's really pretty, really earthy, and it's got some uh, really strong yellow undertones. Next, we have chromium oxide which uh, I'm a little surprised that they have this uh, in their line and I, it was mentioned that it's in this other uh, mixture and they also have that PY150 which um, if you live in California or used to seeing the Prop 65 warnings on labels because of California's Prop 65 um, this color falls into that category, so it it's not one of the ones that they claim not to use. It's not a cadmium, cobalt, lead, arsenic, um, but it is one of the heavier metals. I like this color, so I'm not upset to see it, but that is just something to note. Um, that if you are in California or care about Prop 65, that this color does not fall inside of that label. Or outside, I guess, of, of that label. Another color I'm very excited to try is their Olive Green Deep. This looked... Yes, computer? Are you... What was that noise you just made? You're not on. Oh, guys, technology's trying to kill me. I'm pretty sure. This week has just been a lot. Anyway, this Olive Green Deep looks freaking gorgeous and all the videos that I've seen um, proving to be just as stunning in person. Uh, this is made with PY154, PY110, and PB29. We're going to finish up this row with Green Earth Warm. Um, I'm going to let that sit for a moment because it's going to be difficult. I should have looked ahead. Um, I'm going to do that with a couple on the line underneath here. Just to make sure we're not waiting on anything. Um, and then this is where we get to something that I was really excited to see. Uh, you all know I love my earth tones. Uh, I love them too much. And my own palette, uh, the... Earth Friendly Palette with Da Vinci has probably, in what is most people's opinion, too many earth yellows. Um, a Gallo out of their 86 colors have six PY43s. <laughs> so it's used in a lot of their mixes, but then they also have six versions on their own um, that have like subtle nuances in them. And I'm just so excited to try them all out because honestly, this is like me in a candy shop, right? I love, love earth tones. I'm so happy to have so many to choose from. 
This first one, sorry for that noise. Uh, this first one is French Ochre Sahara. Um, this is certainly the brownest version of PY43 I've ever seen. Um, it's definitely got these very cool undertones. Um, almost kind of a muddy color, but not in a bad way. It's just a, a very deep, not standard ochre type of color. Let's come up and do our green earth just so that I don't forget about it. Oh, it might not even be ready yet. This is might be the toughest one we had so far. Uh, green earth is tough to rewet. Um, it typically has a pretty high binder ratio. Um, it's not a heavily pigmented color. That's not specific to A. Gallo. That is just the way this color typically is and why I was so surprised to see the other version that is being offered and um, that one rewet easier. Try and get a little bit more here in the mass tone. I don't know if you can see that texture on camera, but it's pretty gummy from that gum Arabic. All right. Going on to our um, next Oh, I guess all the PY43s aren't in a row. My apologies. So <laughs> we've got this one. There's There are six total, but uh, we have a couple other in between. So we have Verdacio, um, which is a technique when you um, use an underpainting, a specific way of underpainting. Had to look that one up too. Um, but this is kind of a greenish umber type of color. It's made with PBR7 and PBK11. PBK11, that's the first time I think we've seen it so far, um, and that is Mars Black, uh, is what we typically know it as. They also have a PBK11 on its own, but they call it Roman Black Earth. Verdaccio. It's probably Verdaccio. I keep saying the C's wrong, but I'm not Italian, guys. I'm sorry. All right. Next, we have Green Umber made from PBR8. This is another weaker color. It's had some water sitting on it, but it's still a little bit um, like soft and flowy and a little gummy. Again, not a bad thing, just something to know about. It's going to match in texture to that green earth. Maybe a little less, though, but uh, something similar if you're used to that texture. I focused the camera, but then I didn't press play. Uh, but you didn't miss much. This is Jarosite. It is another yellow ochre light color. Um, and this one, again, um, not quite as much as the green umber or the green earth, but it does have kind of a gummy texture to it. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's definitely a softer version of a yellow ochre. I'm trying to get a good color payoff for our corner here. Then we have gold ochre, another PY43. Okay, this is what I would consider to be a typical yellow ochre. Um, it's very golden in color and it's actually pretty light. It's not very opaque. Um, so you all know my whole, my whole situation with, I love Daniel Smith's yellow ochre, but a lot of yellow ochres are too opaque for my preference. This is another really, uh, luminescent, beautiful yellow ochre. It doesn't have quite as much body, actually. I think it's more transparent than, than Daniel Smith's version, but it's not quite like the Jaro side. It's not quite um, 
that that light gummier color. And I apologize, we have some umber creeping over on our jar of sight. Try and fix that up a little bit. All right. Then we have Moroccan yellow ochre. This one is much creamier than the others that we've tried. This is a really deep, rich tone, very heavily pigmented. Um, I can definitely see why they offer so many versions of PY43 because they're all very different. Um, I could definitely recommend getting a dot card if you're not sure which one that you want, if you want to see them in person. I hope that this reference is helpful for you though. And as a reminder, my patrons get high resolution scans when I do videos like this. So if you want to see the high resolution scan and download a copy for yourself, you can head on over to Patreon. Um, and that is for the $1 and up tiers. So any, any pledge, we'll let you see those. I'm gonna loosen up our next row of paints. Just make sure everyone's working. We've got, oh, I was wrong when I said there were six. There's seven. Um, <laughs> we have another PY43, but there are two more after this. This is raw sienna. So before painting this, I would expect this with the name raw sienna for it to be more brown than the other versions. And look at that. Aside from this one, um, it's definitely got more body. It's got more texture to it. Um, they did a really good job at describing this one. Um, raw sienna can also be made with PBR7. I think more typically is made with PBR7, but this pigment uh, very closely replicates that. And then we have uh, raw sienna badia. Uh, Badia is capitalized, so I assume that is a particular area. I forgot to look that part up. This is beautiful. Oh my gosh. So rich, so beautiful, nice and warm. Um, definitely out of the, if we're using the name raw sienna to gauge this, this would be like raw sienna warm, raw sienna cool. Um, it's a really stunning color. I could see this being very useful in animal portraits. And then finally, we have yellow ochre burgundy. Again, burgundy is capitalized, so I assume that they mean the region of burgundy, not the color. And that's another beautiful one. So definitely for my personal preferences, these three that we just did are my favorites of the seven options. Um, but that yellow, or the, sorry, the French Ochre Sahara takes the cake for being most unique. I've never seen such a brown version of that color before. Or that pigment, I should say. All right, and now we are moving over to the quinacridone gold. I mentioned earlier that um, I'm pretty sure that this used to be formulated differently because I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos on Agallo to try and get some information stored in my head. And this used to be made with PY150 and PO48, which is a very common mixture for quinacridone gold. However, um, with that PO48 being discontinued, um, a lot of people are having to reformulate. So again, I haven't talked to a gallo about this specifically. I'm just uh, taking an educated guess that that is what has happened, um, that they're still using that PY150, but they've replaced the PO48 with the PR101 and PV19. Um, I haven't used a quinacridone gold hue in a while. I think this is how I remember them being. I remember them having nice deep mass tones and then really yellow uh, tints to them. So I think that is is fairly standard. I prefer the ones that tint out a little bit earthier. Um, White Knights has a really nice one called Indian Gold. 
that has a really nice tinting texture. And then I'm lucky um, to still have some of the original PO49, so that's what I typically use, which is why I'm not as familiar with the hues. Next up, we have Transparent Red Oxide, made with PR101. And this is a color that you'll find in a lot of brands. Um, it's, as the name says, it's one of the transparent versions of PR101. A lot of people use it as an alternative to a burnt sienna. And in fact, if you get a burnt sienna that um, is made with PR101, it'll look similar to this. And they do, they do label this as being granulating, so I'm excited to see that one dry a bit. Next, we have Castile Orange. Castile um, is a king uh, was a former kingdom in the region that Spain now occupies. So again, uh, I assume this is referring to that region. Oh, it's a really earthy orange. Like I know it's an earth orange, <laughs> but it feels real earthy. A um, little bit on the brown side. It's got a little bit of um, that gummy texture, just a little bit, not not quite as much as the other colors we've looked at, but um, they do label it as transparent, so it's not a heavy color, even though it's got that PR-102 in it. All right, and then we have uh, Air Colano Red, which I believe Daniel Smith has as well. It is part of Naples in southern Italy, and Air Colano uh, refers to, like, the, it was derived from a word meaning Herculean, like Hercules. So, um, this is a really pretty earth tone. They're labeling it as transparent. I've always thought of Air Colano Red as like a semi-transparent. It is pretty transparent. It's not covering up my writing here, um, but it feels heavier, which I like. I've really come into enjoying heavier bodied watercolors. If you can see there, it's just got like this heavier weight to it that doesn't quite act like what I would consider a transparent watercolor to be, but in my eyes, that is not a bad thing. I, I love it. Um, it's made with both PR-102 and PR-101. Then we have Burnt Sienna, which is made from PBR-7, which is my favorite. This is a really reddish brown color. It's not quite, um, along with my love for Daniel Smith's Yellow Ochre. You also know I love their Burnt Sienna. Uh, it's like this brownish pink color that it was the first Burnt Sienna I ever used, so it's the one I got really used to, and no other brand quite does it like they do. This is a beautiful Burnt Sienna, but it's not that pinky brown color. It's definitely more of a red earth tone. Kind of like that burnt orange. But I do like the heaviness in it. Um, again, it's not labeled as an opaque color. It's not an opaque color, um, but it just, it feels a little bit more substantial than the transparent red oxide over here. All right, next we have Sartorio Red, which the only thing I could find on this name is that the word means tailoring, and it is the name of a men's fashion company or clothing company in Italy. So that's all I got for you there on that name. Uh, it's made from PR102. This is also a transparent color. This one, it granulates, but it does feel lighter. Uh, it doesn't feel quite as heavy as the other earth tones. 
got some really interesting granulation texture. Kind of separates out into like two different shades of brown. So I'm excited to see that one dry. Get just a little bit more of that mask tone. Next up we have Venetian Red. This is uh, a semi-opaque PR102. Um, it is in Earth Red. It is redder than Indian Reds tend to be. Whereas Indian Reds are an Earth Red that tend to lean a little bit, a little bit more towards brown. This Venetian Red is definitely a more vivid red. Next, we have Hematite, which is another PR102. Um, just as a reminder, if, if those of you are here who haven't seen my opaque PR101 video, um, it doesn't cover 102 in particular, but we talk a lot about how within the PR101s, how you can have so many different variations. Um, so if you want to check out that video, I will link it hopefully in the card above. Uh, if I don't remember and you're looking for it, you can leave me a comment and I'll respond to that. <laughs> but I'll try and make sure it's linked above for you. Uh, so PR101 and PR102 are both very versatile colors that depending on how they are processed or where they are found, uh, they can look very different um, in their paint colors. So uh, this one, hopefully you could see that while I was painting out. That's what I mean by like a heavy watercolor. Um, it has just like this body and this heftiness to it, uh, that stands its ground, you know. Um, the next one is called Morleone, I believe. Um, this is one that I couldn't find a translation for, and I'm not sure what the word means itself, but it is similar to a caput mortem or a violet iron oxide. I knew that from watching the videos. Um, I didn't swatch these out beforehand. I can show you. The card is still <laughs> uh, mostly, uh, well, it's touched where I've done swatches with the other ones are still untouched. Um, it's beautiful, heavy, granulating earth tone. It's got kind of like these violety undertones. We're getting close to the end. We have, let's see, 14 more colors. All right, next up is Paraline Maroon. And I had a couple things to say about this. I don't believe it is on the website. I could be wrong, I might have missed it, but I couldn't find it there. Um, so just to note that in case you're trying to look for it, it's also a very different hue than I'm used to Paraline Maroon being. I mean, yes, Paraline Maroon is a deep red color, but this one um, has a texture to it. It has kind of this brown undertone, I guess, would be the way to put that. Um, it just feels much more earth tone than red, and a lot of Paraline Maroons lean red to me. Um, so just to take note of that, if you're a big fan or again, a pigment collector who wants something that's a little bit unique, this is not your typical Paraline Maroon, at least not from what I've seen. Maybe y'all can let me know and be like, oh no, that's totally normal. Um, <laughs> but I'm not used to them being this color. All right, then we have quinacridone chestnut, which is made from PR206. And I could be wrong about this too, but I also believe that PR206 is being discontinued. So um, a lot of companies have pulled this color already. Some companies still have a stock of it. Um, and this one was available. I mean, 
nothing's available on a gala's website right now because everything is listed as sold out until they restock but it's physically on the website whereas like the quinacridone burnt orange is not um, and I saw in an older video, they did wasn't called quinacridone burnt orange, but in an older swatching video here on YouTube, there was the PO48 pigment um, that was available and that's no longer on the website. So for the time being, it looks like they have this. Um, if you're looking to pick something up. It's a really deep red brown kind of color. Then we have uh, three burnt umbers and a chromite brown. So the first of the burnt umbers is burnt umber cypress, which is made with PBR8. Burnt umber is usually made with PBR7, and we will see one of those, um, but the other two are PBR8s. This is again a manganese brown. This is a really pretty color. It's got some really great granulation in it. Uh, burnt umber can be anywhere from a non-granulating color to occasionally I'll see brands that granulate, and I really like it when they do. This reminds me a lot of some of the stone ground paint watercolors. I don't remember. They're not in front of me, so I can't give you a name to compare, but I definitely feel like I've seen this type of shade before, and it's really beautiful. Next we have Burnt Umber Brownish, which is also made from that PBR8. Um, this one has all the same characteristics as the other one, it's just a slightly different hue. So it's still labeled as transparent, still labeled as granulating, and moderately staining. This has a deeper brown hue to it. And then we have Burnt Umber Dark, which is made from the PBR7. This is closer to what I would call a raw umber. Um, and that's interesting to note because it does look more kind of burnt than the other ones do. Uh, it's a more neutral brown. Uh, leaning towards cool. I don't know if I would quite call it cool, but it's it's leaning that way. Still has beautiful granulation. It's probably my favorite of the three. I think it's the most unique. Well, I don't know. These ones have really beautiful granulation. They're all great. Get them all. <laughs> I have a problem with browns. I warned you going in. Uh... All right, and then we're gonna finish off this row with chromite brown. And so this one is interesting. You might see something you don't normally see with watercolors there. It's made with PBR8, but also with FECR204, which is a chemical composition, not a pigment number. Um, and that is iron to chromite. This is gonna be a really neutralized cool brown. This is probably the closest to a raw umber. Like that one was getting there, but this one is definitely cooler. Um, it's got some opacity to it. It's got some granulation to it. It's almost like it. they have a sepia, and we're going to look at that in a second, but it's almost sepia-like um, versus... A raw umber. I don't want to tell you raw umber and then have you be disappointed when you get it. It definitely feels different than the raw umbers that I've used. I would really like to use this in a painting and get to explore it more. Unfortunately, my dot card doesn't have very much on it, so I'm not going to be able to use this one, but maybe in the future um, when I can pick up some other colors, I can hopefully play with that one some more.
All right, then we've got our sepia. Just gonna throw some water on the rest of these so we can get through the rest of those videos efficiently as possible. All right, so the sepia, as expected, is a PBR7 and a PBK9. That's that bone black again and a standard raw or burnt umber. It's perfect, it's great. It's exactly what you'd expect from a sepia. Then we have um, Indigo Genuine, and this is, uh, I just said the word genuine. <laughs> they call it Indigo. My brain is all over the place. They call it Indigo. It's NB1, which is that natural blue one. I wrote the word genuine because it is the genuine Indigo pigment. They do rate this as a light fastness of seven, but Indigo does have a reputation for being fugitive. So I did want to mention that. It's a beautiful color. Um, it's got this really muted blue, uh, kind of blue-gray appearance. I don't get to work with indigo very often, but it is beautiful. Just keep that light fastness in mind because I don't know how uh, accommodating it'll be in the sunlight. Rewetted beautifully uh, as well. And then we have Payne's Gray, which is made with PB15 colon one, which is again, that red shade of phthalo blue, PBK7, which is carbon black, and PV19, which is a Quinn Rose. This is very close to the indigo. Uh, the indigo has a bit of a yellow undertone to it, like a natural yellow. Um, but otherwise, these two colors are, are pretty similar. The Payne's Gray might have a little bit more of a blue hue to it. I don't know why I slept on Payne's Gray for so long. It's not something I've had in my collection. I don't have it on hardly any of my palettes. It's so beautiful. I don't know what I was thinking. I think that was during my single pigments are better phase and um, I just didn't get around to adding a lot on my palette and it's a shame because it's beautiful. All right, we've got Roman Black Earth, which is our Mars Black. This is a granulating black. So we'll be sure to add lots of water. Um, it is a pretty neutral color doesn't really lean cool or warm. I guess if I had to choose, it would lean a little bit towards the warm side of things. Uh, but it's mostly added to colors when you want to deepen their color and add granulation. Add some water at the bottom to make some blooms and try and get that away from the lettering. I accidentally overpainted on the ivory black, but it's going to be close enough. <laughs> so this is that bone black again. It's no longer made with ivory, but it is still made with animal bone. It's going to be a warm, smoother black, so it shouldn't have much of that granulation. Um, in my opinion, honestly, it's a pretty flat black. I don't think I would ever choose, like, aside from the animal ethics of it, uh, you can decide or not decide if you want to use that, but um, I just don't think it's a interesting color. I am not opposed to using blacks at all. Um, I just, carbon and, and ivory black, I think, are my least favorites. I'd much rather have a Mars black or a Payne's gray or some other dark color that I can deepen colors with but has a little bit more interest to it but I am absolutely not opposed to using black watercolor. All right, this next one I think is gonna be a little bit hard to get going from what I've seen in other 
swatching videos. It is Slate Gray, which is PBK19. Uh, their website lists it as Siesto? Siesto? It's S C I S T O. Um, but on the dot card, it says Slate Gray, and Slate Gray is what that pigment is called. It is listed as transparent and non granulating. I think I was looking at some of the symbols wrong earlier, so I just want to correct myself on that. I might have mentioned that a couple colors were listed as transparent when they were semi-transparent. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll try and, I can't scan this, but I'll try and take pictures at the end of all of this and maybe either put those in the video or put them on Patreon or something, or all of their pigment information is on their website. So. Um, my sincere apologies if I misrepresented anything that was not my intent. Um, I can show you here. I have to ignore my little notes though, okay? Um, some of these I was saying, like the Burnt Sienna was listed as transparent. That has a line through it though, and I just don't think I saw the line. So that's semi-transparent, whereas the empty circle, um, like over here, is the transparent. So I apologize, but... Uh, for a handmade company, they list all of their pigments, uh, not only the names of the pigments, but the properties of the information on their website. So I highly recommend checking that out if you have any questions at all, or if I've, I've misspoken on all of those, um, their website has information for you. So these last two are white and gold, so I put black stripes on them so we can see the opacity of them. Um... I am in the camp that unless you have a very specific purpose for why you want white, I don't typically recommend you purchase it. Um, typically in watercolors, you'll just use the white of the paper, but as we saw, it was mixed into a lot of the specialty colors and it might be useful for you if you wanna make pastels um, or have like some kind of opacity to, to other colors you're mixing. Again, I think it's used a lot more for floral artists, but um, I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to own it unless you very specifically have a reason for it. And then we also have Antique Gold. This is made with metallic pigment and PY43 according to the dot card. I'm trying to to formulate my thoughts here without getting my head directly under the camera. Um, if y'all remember back to when I did my Kramer video, I don't own a lot of clothes. Okay, there it's doing it a little bit. Can I zoom in any closer? Nope, that's it. Uh, Kramer's pigment like dances across the page and it's really mesmerizing. This is doing it a little bit, but not a ton. Um, I don't use a lot of gold paint, but I do like that they added the PY43 in there. So you have a little bit more of that gold color shining through. I think that would probably be useful for people who replicate their art with like a scanner because you'll still get the gold color on the print, whereas the metallic pigments can scan really oddly sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about going to do it for our swatch. I'll wait for these to dry and then I'll make sure to give you those good, good tape peel pictures and then I'll put the scans up on Patreon. So thank you all for joining me today and I hope you enjoyed it, even though it wasn't what our, our scheduled content was supposed to be for this week. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Have a good weekend. I don't know what I was trying to do with that sign off earlier. We're not done. Okay, we're gonna peel the tape off of this because that's always satisfying to watch. Um, but there's a couple more things that I forgot to talk about that I meant to. I have some notes for myself. Um, I mentioned earlier in the video that the next restock at the time of uploading this video is August 28th, 2022. Um, I believe that is gonna be at 7 a.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. CES tea time, but change that into whatever time zone you're in. Um, they also work with One Tree Planted. I think that's new. I don't want to get that wrong, but um, which is really great. It's a woman-owned business. 
it's a small business. There's just so many great things uh, about this company that uh, are really great. And if you're interested in supporting them, uh, I'll leave all the links in the description so you can find them. Um, did I leave off anything else? I don't think so. But we do want to go over some of our favorites before we end the video. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I don't know why I'm peeling this off. We only need one, one edge. I can't multitask. Uh, was that not clear? <laughs> Those of you who are on my Patreon know that because we do live tutorials over there where I just... I just keep talking and nonsense comes out of my mouth, but um, for those of you who don't know, don't know me, uh, my, my normal speech is not anywhere near as uh, coherent as my videos pretend to be because those are scripted. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna get off all this little tape. Um, this is, I think, quarter inch thick masking tape. Uh, it's pretty hard to find. I was able to find it at a uh, paint, what am I looking for? Art supply store, a uh, small chain art supply store. And that they went out of business before I left San Jose. So at least 2018, I guess. Uh, anyway, I've been using the same tape ever since then. <laughs> but I believe that if you look really hard, you can find it on Amazon, uh, or you might be able to find it in other art supply stores. And uh, I normally do my Swatch With Me videos, I say normally, but you know, normally being two and a half years ago and prior, uh, I normally did black lines in between each one, but I was like, you know what? Tape is easier, let's do that, and it'll look nice and cute. So here we have all of our finished swatches. Let me bring you in closer so you can see some nice granulation. We're not going to go too close though. Make sure you can see a whole row. All right, so looking at the yellows, I have to say I'm going to be boring for me and just say that my favorite is the royal yellow because I love PY154 and that's a pretty standard way for me to go. Um, all right, so yeah, I like the royal yellow. I think the other ones have other purposes. I don't find myself needing multiple yellows these days. Um, I typically don't pick up uh, a warm yellow anymore so I would be happy with just the royal yellow as long as I have a red that can also mix an orange color but that being said um, I really like this Hokkaido orange I don't use this pigment very often um, the sheet says I double checked the sheet says non granulating but that looks like granulation to me so I don't know if I'm incorrect or if if that's granulation, but I really like that. So I might consider picking that up in a specialty palette. So, so far we've got the Royal Yellow, the Hokkaido Orange, um, hard choices in the reds. I'm gonna say if I was picking a well-rounded palette, I would pick up the Vermilion because it leans a little bit more towards, towards the orange. And then I might skip over this midsection. Normally I pick P to, uh, PR254 but I might go with the vermilion in this case and then pick up. I like the hue of this one better, but I trust the light fastness more on the permanent carmine. So I might go with those two. Um, the Quinn Magenta is really nice. The Quinn Violet's really nice. I love both the Pietra Rosa and Potter's Pink. I would have a hard time choosing between the two. I know that the Potter's Pink would be more versatile um, in terms of like it's a single pigment, but I really love the hue of that. And because I already own Potter's Pink, I might be inclined to pick up the specialty color in this case. I'm okay passing up the uh, natural pigments. I don't need the specialty ones, but um, they're certainly beautiful if, if you like collecting those types of pigments or like those hues. These purples are all very similar, so I wouldn't recommend getting all of them, especially at, you know, nine-ish dollars of pan. I think that I would go with the mineral violet. Again, I mentioned earlier that I don't love cool violets personally, so I think I'd go with the mineral violet. The Nocturno is really interesting. Um, it's certainly pretty. It's up my alley in terms of being like this really cool multi-granulating pigment that has a lot going on there, and I know it's a fan favorite. I'm not 
entirely convinced I need a pan of it. I think that if I had the ultramarine, which I'd probably want to get anyway, um, and then I, ha I always have a PR101 on my palette, if not multiple PR101s. So this looks like it is maybe that uh, Caput Mortem type color and then an ultramarine and then just a little bit of that PV19. So I think I could get around not having this, but I can certainly understand if you want to pick that up. Um, the Zirconium Blue I love and it's a specialty color, so I'd probably get that. Um, and then again, these two are very close, the Ultramarine and the Yinman Blue. If you're a paint collector, I understand why you'd wanna go with this. I can't justify spending um, what are, what are our series here? Uh, this would be a $9 and this would be $40. So I would pick the $9 one. This is deeper. It has a different granulation pattern. It's very beautiful. But if I'm going for cost effective, I'd pick up this one. Um, the Indian Throne did dry a little bit flatter, which is fine. It's still a great dark color, but I don't know that I would be inclined to like have to pick it up in this brand. Uh, the Lapis Lazuli had really good payout. Again, not a color that I personally feel the need to spend a lot of money on, but I can certainly understand why someone would want to. Um, I do like this Midnight Blue. <sighs> I don't know, guys. It's so hard to decide. We'll give this one a maybe. And then I really like the hues that we have here, these uh, color mixes. Um, this blue, or the teal blue does a really good job at approximating cobalt teal. So I think I might want to pick that one up, possibly. Um, I guess with, if I have the zirconium blue, I probably don't also need the teal blue. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And then I'd probably pick up the aquamarine in this hypothetical palette because it's the closest to what I would use as a cool blue. This one is a little bit... Uh, warmer than I would like if I'm getting the ultramarine. So having both of these blues, I think would be a really nice balance along with the zirconium. You'd have a really big range of blues you could get there. Sorry, I'm a little off camera there. I have to pick up the Harbor Blue. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> that would absolutely be on the list. Um, I like the Dark Forest. It is a little bit muted now that it's dried, uh, similar to the Indian Throne. I think I could pass on the rest of the greens on this one if I had to be picking juicy. I mean, all these are beautiful colors, but... Um, I could pick and choose if I had to. Um, then the one that's going to be harder for me is on an earth tone page. This one is still not entirely dry, but we're going to uh, be a little risky here and try and get this going. There are children running laps upstairs, so <laughs> I apologize if you can hear their thudding. Um, really try to get this done before the end of the workday so that they wouldn't be home, but... You know how apartment life goes. I see most of you do anyway. Uh, sorry that most of this is not in focus. I'm just trying to get my tape loose. And we can go for, oh, gotta zoom you back out so you can see everything. All right, get those good peels on. I guess I could have not gone all the way to the end of the page since we didn't have enough colors to fill everything but i wasn't thinking about it at the time all right where i was able to pass up on all of the other greens uh, i'm going to make up for in this first row because i need most of them <laughs> at least half of them um i would say the sap green and the olive green deep for sure. Those are super my jam. I also love the chromium oxide, but if again, if I was saving costs, I could maybe pass on that one. But these two definitely would be added. The olive green deep is absolutely beautiful. Um, we've got some really interesting, cool earth tones here that, did I zoom in too close? I don't know. Maybe I would get the French ochre just because it's so unique. And then the, either the raw sienna or the yellow ochre burgundy, I think are my favorites. This one is really beautiful and really rich. It's also very warm. I don't know. I love them all. It's so hard for me to choose. I could, I could pass on these ones. These are a little bit lighter for my person. I missed a piece of tape. I'm sure you guys were shouting at me like, hey, Denise, you didn't finish that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think I'd go French ochre. 
Maybe I would go raw sienna body yet. It's so pretty. Okay, French ochre Sahara and then one of these two colors. I can't decide, but I'd have to think on it. Um, this quinacridone gold is a little bit yellow for my taste, so I'd probably pass on that, uh, just personally, since I still have the original stuff. Um, I think this would be a really good mixing color. It's not a color I tend to gravitate towards, but it's one that I want to explore a little bit more. I would definitely have to pick up the burnt sienna. I hesitate as I said that because I'm like, is it definitely? Probably. I'd pick up the burnt sienna, the more leone. Um, this perylene maroon is perplexing me. It's, it's not a typical perylene maroon, but it's so pretty. Um, I think you could probably go with either of these two colors, but not both. They're in that similar family. I love the hue of this, but I think that the granulation wins me over on this one here. The quinacridone chestnut is gorgeous, but I'm trying to emotionally not get attached because I don't know how long it'll be here. And then I would probably go with the burnt umber brownish, the burnt umber dark. And again, like this chromite brown is so interesting. And because I don't have anything like it, I might pick it up because of the fact that it's a specialty color. Um, if you don't care that it's a specialty color, then I might go with the sepia instead. Um, between these two colors, they are so similar. They did an amazing job at replicating indigo, if, if that was their intention. Um, there's a little bit more blue hue here. There's a little bit more yellow in the undertone, so it's not an identical match, but it's very close, and I would definitely pick that up. And then here you can see how beautiful that granulation is with the, um, the Mars black. I end up, like I end, I will get this color because I'm like, oh yeah, it's really pretty. It granulates a lot and then I don't use it. So knowing that about myself, I probably wouldn't pick that up. I'd probably just stick with the Payne's gray, um, but it is really beautiful. Uh, this light gray is really interesting, but I don't know that I'd have enough uses for it. And then the antique gold dried really well. Um, it has a really beautiful sheen in person. I don't know if that's translating on camera. Maybe I can show it to you. Are you getting an idea of what that's like? It's a good gold. I don't use metallics very often, but it's it's a good color. Um, and then I pretty much never buy white on its own, but if you do, seems like an okay version. Uh, the buff titanium is also really pretty. I think definitely between these two, I'd go with the buff titanium. I think it's more interesting, more versatile, um, and you can make those really pretty pastel mixes that I was talking about. So now that's the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed this, my first look at a gallo and the swatch with me. First one revived in the last two and a half years. Thank you so much to a gallo for sending me this dot card so I can share it with you all. And I will make sure to get these resources up on Patreon so that those uh, who are over there have all that information as well. Let me know in the comments if you have any favorites from A Gallo, if there's any that you're really looking to try. Um, and let me know if there's anything that you want to see on this channel in terms of uh, content, in terms of review. Are there products that they have that you've been looking for uh, or like on your wish list and want to see more of? Uh, let me know. All right, I think that'll do it. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you in the next video. And until next time, happy painting.